Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's that time again. Another twelve months have whipped by, and the fifth Horror Babble Twelve Days of Christmas special is upon us. This year, we're off to the northeast of England, in a baker's dozen at the Zetland Hotel. It'll be a night like no other for the guests at the Zetland Hotel. They each have their reasons for being there, but there's high strangeness at work, too. The story consists of twelve chapters, each airing daily from today, Boxing Day, through to January 6th. Again, we'd like to thank horror babblers everywhere for supporting our work. These specials wouldn't exist without you. Now let's get to it. A Baker's Dozen at the Zetland Hotel by Ian Gordon Regarding the Zetland Hotel Situated a mere stone's throw from the North Sea, the Zetland Hotel offers pristine boutique accommodation to those seeking escape from the tiresome trappings of modern life. This remarkable property consists of thirteen glorious oceanfront rooms, twelve elegant chambers with four-poster beds and roomy en-suites, and the inimitable Royal Suite, an outstanding space boasting capacious sitting areas, luxurious furnishings, large bathroom complete with sunken bath, and the pièce de résistance, a broad and uninterrupted view of the North Sea. Guests may read in the library, or relax in the billiard room. A well-stocked bar is available for those in need of refreshment, day or night. And outside, five acres of private, manicured gardens offer an alternative to the public promenade. Rise at dawn to admire the eclectic topiary lit by the climbing sun. The Zetland Hotel. May your days and nights be golden and tranquil. Chapter One The Seeker in the Shadows Ian MacDonald, said the short man with the jet black hair, addressing the curious fellow behind the desk of the reception area at the Zetland Hotel. The hotelier, a tidy looking individual with a plain face, nodded and added Ian's name to the guest book. After doing so, he turned to face the key rack to his rear. There were thirteen hooks in total, each of which held a key, with the exception of the hook numbered thirteen. Clearing his throat, the plain-faced man unhooked the key to room one, then, with Ian at his heels, took off along a narrow corridor in its direction. As they went, the hotelier's bland tones remarked, "'I imagine you'll be rather comfortable in this particular suite, sir.' "'I'm certain.' Ian agreed, looking about him vainly for signs of activity. "'Any other guests booked in this evening?' he asked. To which the plain-faced man, his immaculate brogue striking the polished parquet rhythmically, simply nodded suggestively. Reaching the end of the corridor, the stilted hotelier proceeded to unlock the door to Ian's quarters for the night, and bade him enter, handing him the key as he did so. If anything isn't to your liking, Mr. MacDonald, come see me at the main desk. Sure thing, Ian replied, crossing the threshold enthusiastically. You're more than welcome to explore the hotel, the hotelier continued, but be mindful of other guests, particularly later, when we're at full capacity. Ian nodded, repeating, Sure thing. Then, with some hesitation, the plain-faced man, whose colourless eyes looked past Ian rather than at him, added, "'Perhaps you'll be especially mindful, should you choose to explore the first floor. The guest in room thirteen must not, under any circumstances, be disturbed.' And like a broken record, the words, "'Sure thing!' fell from Ian's lips. The hotelian nodded, and retreated, the echo of his gentle footfalls filling the room." 
Ian, with a newfound sense of excitement, studied the room, lapping up his surroundings like a hungry hound. It was elegant indeed, a sparsely furnished suite betokening the kind of contemporary luxury one might associate with a serviced apartment in Copenhagen or Stockholm. But the coffee-bean four-poster bed, writing-table and clothes-rack were of no real interest to the Zetland Hotel's latest guest. The short man with the jet-black hair had travelled from his home in Ripon to the Red Car and Cleveland coast on the back of a rumour. It was an old rumour, a rumour printed on the pages of a little-known early twentieth-century travel book called Smith's Travels in Cleveland. In the book, the forgotten writer Charles Allen Smith spoke of an intriguing painting he'd observed adorning the wall of an inconspicuous corridor on the second floor of the Zetland. Unlit are the corridors belonging to the second floor, wrote Smith. One gets the impression that the proprietors prefer it that way, dark and dusty, to deter the would-be explorer. But I'm not so easily dissuaded. Up into the shadows I went, torch in hand, roaming the halls with the courage of a ghoul. If one is thorough, and walks with head high, then one is certain to discover a magnificent portrait hanging in the gloom. The identity of its haunting subject is a mystery, of a lineage seemingly unknown to the proprietors, a dazzling beauty left a brood in the shadows, of a hand apparently gone from this world. What had attracted Ian MacDonald to the rare book in the first place was anybody's guess. Even the charity shop in which it was found was far from his usual haunts. But there was something in the description of that painting on page 113 that filled him with an ineluctable yearning. Uncovering no other references to the mysterious portrait online, cyberspace being the source of all worldly knowledge as far as he was concerned, he set his sights on the Zetland that very afternoon, and made the fifty-mile journey in just under an hour. It wasn't the most impulsive thing he'd ever done, but it was sure to come close. He simply had to get a look at her, the beauty in the gloom, the brooder in the shadows. Wasn't there something tragic about that? Tragedy tinged with, perhaps, romance? and it was with thoughts of surreal romance in his head that the short man with the jet-black hair established himself at the Zetland, unpacking a few choice items for the task ahead. A torch, a face mask, for Ian couldn't cope with the idea of filling his lungs with cobwebs, and a compact digital camera. He'd wait a while, though, before setting off on his quest. Wait for the hotel to fill up a bit. After all, the hotelier had implied that there would be other guests in addition to himself and the enigmatic guest in room thirteen. Armed with a glass of tap water, Ian strolled to the window and gazed out towards the North Sea. It was 2 p.m., a December 2 p.m., and as such the waters were already dark, recently abandoned by the fleeting winter sun. He watched the waves— noted the lack of pedestrians on the esplanade, looked forward to the little adventure that awaited him. I might have an hour, he muttered to himself, turning to admire the inviting four-poster bed that occupied the majority of the room. In short order, sleep followed. An hour or so later, Ian awoke to the sound of footsteps in the corridor outside. He'd slept rather heavily, in his new, unfamiliar environment, and fully clothed. So it was with a mixture of lethargy and confusion that he climbed to his feet and wandered to the ensuite in order to splash water on his face. Returning to the room proper, he approached the door to his suite in order to eavesdrop. The hotelier was unlocking the door to a room a few doors down from his. A discourse was in progress— but he couldn't make out the voices clearly enough to discern the words. Moments later, Ian heard the door close, and listened to the retreating footsteps of the hotelier. At least one other guest had arrived. To confirm this, 
He kicked his shoes off and left the room briefly, tiptoeing along the length of the corridor towards the reception area to survey the key rack behind the desk. Not only had one other guest arrived, but three. The keys to rooms two through four were now missing from the key rack. Rooms one, two, and three were located to the west of the reception area, with rooms four, five, and six located to the east, and it was in this latter direction that the short man now observed the hotelier admitting the fourth arrival to room four. He didn't manage to catch sight of the guest, just the back of the plain-faced man, as he followed the visitor into the suite. Yes, sir, yes, sir, five rooms full, Ian muttered to himself jovially, before creeping back to his room. Once more he splashed water on his face in an effort to rid himself of the sluggishness his afternoon snooze had brought about, then grabbed the bits and pieces he'd put aside earlier. Seconds later, he was out in the corridor again, inching along its outer edge, keen to avoid the prying eyes of the odd hotelier and his new neighbours. His shoes remained off for the journey. Silent running was essential. Reaching the reception area, he saw that the hotelier was standing at a filing cabinet with his back turned, busying himself with generic duties. Ian immediately took the opportunity to make a dash for the stairs, two flights of which were located either side of the sizable mahogany desk. Up he flew, swift as a bird, till he found himself standing by the door to room thirteen, a door twice the size of the door to his room, a vast suite located directly above the reception area. Giving the room little to no thought, he turned his attention to yet another flight of stairs, which continued upwards to the second floor. Ignoring the staff-only barrier, he hopped it as a child might skip a rope, and climbed, two steps at a time, into the darkness above. If one is thorough, and walks with head high, Ian quoted from memory, flicking his torch on, then one is certain to discover a magnificent portrait hanging in the gloom. Reaching the top of the dark stairs, the short man found himself standing amongst the clatter of yesteryear. The beam of the torch disclosed all manner of disquieting shapes, numerous objects of varying size disguised by dusty white sheets. It was a landing area of sorts, in which several uninviting doors and corridors, offering further avenues of discovery, met his inquiring eyes. Not only was it dark, but also silent, silent as the grave a space allowing for only Ian's erratic breathing and the beating of his heart. For a while he wandered the dusty halls as a mouse might explore a maze, occasionally sniffing the air in order to acquaint himself with previously uncharted locations. But wherever he went, the corridors were bare and the doors were locked tight. All at once— It occurred to him that this Smith character had spoken of this magnificent portrait over a century ago. What were the chances of it still hanging there today? The thought arrived just as he discovered a new fork in the road, a slim passage that he would have surely missed had the beam of his torch targeted the wall to his left a moment too late. Following this passage, Ian reached a small space enclosed by a vaulted ceiling, at the end of which, where one might expect to find a window overlooking the ocean, or the hotel's expansive lawns, hung a large picture frame, an empty picture frame. The short man's disappointment was abrupt and harsh, a punch to the gut the likes of which he'd never felt before. Damn, he mumbled weakly. But as he approached the frame, some five feet square it was, He saw that it wasn't empty after all. The frame housed a canvas, painted a light olive green. As Ian's torch shone upon it, he saw that it was highly reflective, slick in places. Closer still he crept, and was baffled by a sudden sensation of dampness 
as his sock-covered foot trod on something. Pointing the torch at the parquet, he observed a number of splodges, blobs of pink paint directly below the picture frame. Now, it wasn't in Ian's nature to jump to absurd conclusions, but the sight of this glossy olive-green canvas, coupled with the rosy wet globules of paint on the dusty floor, instilled in the short man the fanciful idea that the painting subject had climbed out of the frame, like a burglar climbing through a window on a rainy night. And as much as he knew this to be false, he couldn't shake the impression— and was overcome by a tremendous desire to depart this scene of high strangeness. He removed his paint-soaked sock, and retreated, moving swiftly in the direction of the lower levels. But as he renegotiated the interminable passageways, he felt absolutely certain that he wasn't alone. There were no figures in the gloom, no sounds emanating from the locked rooms, just an awful, tantalizing impression that another soul was nearby, wandering the silent halls. It was only later, when he reached his suite on the ground floor and locked the door behind him, that he let out the breath he'd been holding for what felt like an eternity. The disappointment, and certainly the fear he'd felt, dissipated rather quickly, though, usurped by an overwhelming sense of urgency. I have to get out of here, he blurted. Within five minutes, Ian MacDonald had checked out of the Zetland Hotel, and was sitting in his car, looking up at its strange silhouette against a sapphire sky. What just happened? he asked himself. But as he pulled away from the Zetland, turning his attention to the road in front of him, he thought not so much of the strange painting in the attic nor of his seemingly inexorable desire to see it, but of the way in which the unremarkable hotelier bade him farewell, not with a frown, but with a grin. Thanks for listening today. Join us again tomorrow for the next part.